Welcome to True Crime Wine Wednesday. You are probably watching this on a Friday though. I am Sherilyn Dale and I am so glad you found me. Thanks for being patient during my recovery, guys. I guess I haven't missed an upload though because I pre-filmed, so. Um, but thank you for the well wishes. I felt them, I continue to feel them. I am feeling better every day. And yeah, hopefully we have our mic situation sorted. I am praying that it is. I don't really know what happened, but um, I've been fidgeting around, went back to some old school settings. So let's hope for the best. We're gonna get started very quickly, but before we do, I just wanted to quickly thank everybody who has already bought the new merch. So exciting, um, I'm obsessed with it. I actually had like a team do this and design it and I couldn't be more obsessed. I'm like really wrinkly, sorry guys. I live in this stuff, like live, breathe, eat, sleep, go grocery shopping, do all of the errands, do all of the things in this stuff and I'm so excited about it. If you haven't checked it out yet, there will be a link below. I believe it's, oh my God, how do I not know my own website? Okay, yeah, got it. It is shopsherilyndale.com. And yeah, we've got the, the long sleeve. One thing I love about it is like with all the little old school cell phones that are down the sleeves and on the track suits, it's down the pants. I'll, I'll show you quickly. This is the back of the sweater though. Probably my favorite. I just like look back in the mirror all the time. And then on the front, it's got the little cell phone. And then yeah, the legs with the little cell phones coming down, too cute. And then of course, Merlot just needed her own moment. We've got the God Save Merlot <laughs> merch, it kills me. I know it's summer, so we have these in t-shirts as well. I'm also going to see if we can get these, what the f is wrong with people, in t-shirts too for summer. Cause I believe we only have these in long sleeve now. So keep checking, stay tuned with that. I'll give you an update as well. But if you haven't purchased anything yet, go over there. We also have cell phone cases. I am obviously currently rocking the Merlot one, but we have some other ones too. And fun fact, the one that says Sippendale, I, I drew that all by my darn self on Procreate. So that's just a little, a little fun information for you. If you do end up getting some, please make sure to tag me in it. I love, love, love to see it. And I usually will share it on my Instagram. Also, so that everybody can see your beautiful faces. If you don't want that, ha that to happen, then I guess like don't tag me, but also I wanna see, so please tag me. <laughs> Okay, all right, today we are talking about a case that is going to make you want to take whatever device you are watching this on right now and just like chuck it across the room or out the window. Don't, because it's not productive for anybody. But I'm just forewarning you. We are talking about the death of Brandon Embry, who was a healthy 33-year-old male who was found in his home naked unconscious, laying in a pool of blood, his body covered in injuries, head to toe. We're talking puncture wounds, lacerations, bruises, scratches. His house was ransacked, it was destroyed. And Brandon's death was initially ruled natural, listing pneumonia as the cause. Later, it was amended, but to undetermined. Now, Brandon's loved ones believe that they have a pretty good idea of what truly happened to Brandon. Their belief is that a history of recent ER visits in 2019 that seemed to coincide with a new relationship may have the answers on amending his cause of death to murder. Before we get started, if you could make sure that you are subscribed and notified to the channel, it would mean more to me than you know. We are so close to 200,000 subscribers. I cannot believe it. I have a new video for you every single Wednesday and sometimes on a Friday as well. All right, let's get started. Before we do, here is our riddle. What has hands but cannot clap? All right, I think before we get into it, it's really important to get to know a little bit about Brandon, just so that you can have a good understanding of where his family is coming from and why they are having such a tough time understanding this manner of death and the way they came to this conclusion, just to know like his habits, who he personally was by those who knew him. Brennan was born on September 7th, 1986. 86 baby right here too. He grew up with his mother, Sarah, and his stepfather, Reg, and his brother, Scott. He also had an adopted sister named Rachel. And Brandon is described as the more introverted of the kids. He was friendly, he was well-liked, but he just had no 
problem entertaining himself. His mom even said that there would be a number of times where kids from the neighborhood would come and ask Brandon to play and he would be like, um, I'm actually reading right now. I'll think about it. Maybe meet you guys out there in a little bit. Reading is definitely something that he did enjoy. His family even nicknamed him Webster. In school, he got mostly A's. He loved learning. He excelled in the math, science, history side of things specifically. And even when he was a young student, he participated in spelling bees. I don't know if there was ever spelling bees in my area, but I love seeing spelling bees. I don't know why I'm so fascinated to see little nuggets just like shoot off these long words that I don't even understand most of the time. Not only was he book smart, but he was also very athletic too. In high school, he played football, basically anything Brandon put his mind to, he excelled at. My impression um, about him being rather adaptable, I think came from him being raised in a military family. Maybe that also contributed a little bit to him being kind of introverted too. His mom and stepdad were both in the military, so they moved around a lot. They lived all over the United States. And I also read that they lived in Italy too, which would have been super amazing. So just based off the way Brandon grew up, I think like as parents, you kind of think, oh, like where, where is life gonna take you? Especially if you've got someone very, you know, academically interested and always wanting to learn, maybe they're going to want to, you know, become a scientist or something like that. So Brandon's family was really surprised when at 18, he was like, I'm gonna join the military too. He ended up enlisting in the Navy. Like I said, it wasn't a complete shock. Both of his parents uh, were in the military. His mom also was in the Navy. And I mean, physically, Brandon was a great candidate. He was a big dude. He really enjoyed powerlifting, so he definitely was prepared for like the physical demands of the job. And the role he ended up getting was nuclear submarine machinist mate. I guess this is one of the most difficult roles to achieve just based on its physical demands, but also you need to be rather intelligent. So it's no surprise Brandon was a shoe in He's like six feet tall, built and brilliant. He was stationed out of Hawaii, which I can only imagine how beautiful it would have been to live out there. But after about six years at 23, his career was cut short. He had an injury as well as some PTSD that were really affecting him. And so he was honorably discharged. After leaving the Navy, he moved back to Monroe, Washington to just kind of recalibrate, he moved in with his parents for a little bit, got a job for a short time at a soup kitchen. And then he really took a liking and interest in welding. After Brennan's time in the Navy, and moving back home, he ended up getting his own apartment. And this was kind of like the, the first time that he was on his own, able to really figure out what his interests were. Even though he had moved away from his family at 18 years old, it was kind of like moving in with another family, like your military family, you have a lot of strict guidelines to follow. So this was like the first time that Brandon was kind of on his own. He started exploring like his interest in music and found himself really gravitating to a heavy metal. He was also really into the Viking culture and I mean if you see a photo of Brandon that is so fitting he totally looks like a, a like big Viking dude he could have been cast on Vikings for sure I also read that he got into like home brewing um I believe he he brew mead instead of like beer though and so after a few years of work figuring out what he wanted to do he decided he wanted to go back to school he enrolled in a local community college called green river there he was studying bioengineering and chemical pre-engineering and in two years he earned his associate's degree and then enrolled in the university of washington to take a four-year program for his engineering degree and this is kind of around the same time that he was also putting himself out there um, in the dating world. Kind of also for the first time too. Growing up, his family hadn't really seen him dating anybody or really interested in anybody. His family described him as a, a, like a late bloomer in the dating department. So when he first moved home, there were like a little bit of flings here and there, but nothing really too serious until his late 20s. Around the time that he started in university, he had moved in with a girl for the first time. This is one of his more serious relationships. My understanding is Brandon was quite committed to this relationship and when it didn't work out he actually only had a month left of university and made the decision to 
leave and move back home. So I'm, I'm assuming there was quite a bit of pain there. So he moved back to North Carolina just for that support with family. He did get into another relationship, but that also fizzled out around February, 2019. But after these relationships, Brandon's family could see that not having somebody really weighed on his heart, even though he was somebody who grew up quite independent and um, to himself, once you kind of get a taste of having that companionship and just somebody being there, even if you're introverted, it's really nice to just have somebody in the same room doing your own thing, right? And so it sounded like that is what Brennan was really looking for. While he was trying to find that perfect fit in his personal life, he was doing really well career-wise. He was like racking up welding certificates. He was getting really good jobs, jobs that were allowing him to travel so that he could get even better pay. And it was during a shift at work in February, 2019, that something really concerning happened to Brandon. He was working in Greensboro at the time and he was complaining uh, to his boss just about not feeling well. He kind of made the statement that he didn't want to miss work. So he was there, but his boss said that just looking at Brandon, he could tell something was off, but he was confused. He didn't really know what it was. I'm not sure if he just had like bad experience with some of his staff in the past, but he almost got the impression that like Brandon was on something. He felt like something was so off that he actually asked him to leave work and go and get drug tested. So Brandon agrees and as he's heading to go and get checked out, he pulls over into like a McDonald's parking lot and there things went south really fast. He just starts screaming in agony. He's complaining about stomach pain and people just see him start to throw up outside of his truck. So somebody at the McDonald's sees this, calls 911. When first responders arrive, they were struggling getting any information out of Brandon. He was conscious, but he was wasn't answering full questions and he seemed to be really confused. He didn't even know how he got to the McDonald's to begin with. So he's brought to the R and as per the reports, his mental state is described to be, uh, again, very confused and erratic. He, erratic? <laughs> Just erratic, Sherilyn. He was said to be acting delirious and a little bit combative, which makes sense if you have no idea what your surroundings are and then all of a sudden you're kind of like in and out of it at a hospital in the ER not knowing what's going on. While in the ER, he started to go into respiratory distress and they were having quite a hard time stabilizing him. So he was placed into a medically induced coma and he was in the ICU for several days so that they could stabilize him, bring him back. At the time, his kidneys were failing, so he had to be on dialysis. Like he was in really rough shape. Also on his medical records of that time, it seemed like the medical staff also shared the same suspicions as his boss that he was on some sort of drug. So they did run a drug test, but it came back negative. So after five very rough days at the hospital, Brandon is released, but he's not really given any answers. Just that like, no, you weren't on drugs. I actually got a lot of information from a fantastic blog slash podcast, Murder She Told. And Kristen from Murder, she told, asked Brandon's mom a bit about Brandon's health just to see like had anything like this happened before. And she said that there were some minor health issues in his life, but nothing that would have ever prepared them for that type of episode. Prior to being hospitalized, he had discovered that he had low testosterone. So he was giving himself testosterone shots regularly. He also had some back issues stemming from his time in the Navy as well as a pretty significant injury that happened when he was really into powerlifting. Again, he had made a full recovery from that though. So the only real thing that he was dealing with at that time was sleep apnea, which he did have a CPAP machine for. So nothing really that stood out to just attribute to this sudden attack. And his mom also said that Brandon took very well care of himself. Like I said, he was super into his health, working out. He would log his foods, the supplements, the vitamins, all of the things that he was taking. He was even in the process of 
also attaining like a personal trainer certificate. So thinking that, you know, this was just some freak one-off unexplained issue, he just plowed forward in life. Not even two months later though, on the morning of April 24th, he had another health scare. He was at work again and suddenly just passed out, smoked his head on the ground. He woke up to everybody around him seeing if he was okay, but he came to pretty fast and was just like, I think I just like got up too fast, just dizzy. So he wanted to stay at work and keep working. About an hour later though, he passed out again. So this time his employer was like, no, we're calling an ambulance. EMS was called. He's brought back to the hospital, but this time he is way better at communicating. So he's much more lucid and he's able to articulate to the nurses that he's got a really bad headache. That could have been because he fell. I mean, like he's like six feet tall, 300 pounds, big dude probably hurts if you fall from that height. But he's also saying that he's got severe stomach pain. He was throwing up and was experiencing like quite severe nausea. The only thing that he could think led to that was that maybe the meat he had ate the evening prior wasn't as good as he thought it was. They ran his blood work again. It appears that they also ran to test against illegal drugs. The results came back and no answers. There were no drugs in his system and they couldn't figure out what was attributing to his throwing up nausea headaches. This whole thing almost I exactly played out the exact same way two months later in June. Same thing no answers. He starts moving forward with his life. By August, he's staying pretty positive. He's been feeling a lot better, thinking that he's moving past whatever it is. He had found a job just outside of uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. So he was preparing to leave his home in Ashboro to go and move closer to his job site. Around this time, he saw a lot of his family. They were actually helping him get his apartment all ready to get it packed up so that he could move. And they said that Brennan was in really good spirits. He was excited. Although he was complaining about being like more tired than usual. Despite that though, he was in really good spirits. Several weeks later after Brennan had made the decision that he was gonna do this move, his birthday was approaching. And the day before his birthday actually, he had uh, told that his, his mom that he would help her dog sit, or he was gonna dog sit for her, sorry. That, that phrasing sounded off. She was going to pick up his sister, and so she needed somebody to stay with the dog. And he was like the best person, she said, to ask to dog sit, because he was the one who would get down on the ground, play with the dog, and just like laugh and roll around, always in good spirit. His mom, Sarah, said that he looked very happy. He actually had just been let go from a job that he was at, but he was super optimistic because some companies had been reaching out to a recruiting agency that he was working with showing interest in Brandon. So he was like, I, I got this. What Sarah didn't know about leaving that day and Brandon dog sitting for her was that that was going to be the last time that she would ever see her son alive. On Saturday, which would have been Brandon's birthday, Sarah was on her way back home from picking up Brandon's sister in Kentucky. She spoke with him on the phone, letting him know that she was on her way back. She said, happy birthday. But by the time she arrived home, which was around eight or nine, Brandon had already gone back to his apartment knowing that she was gonna be home soon. According to his dad, it sounded like he had left because he was gonna go and get ready for some birthday plans that he had with a girl that he was chatting with. But then he had also messaged his dad later and said that those fell through so that he was just hanging out at home. Over the next couple of days, Brandon did speak with his family, but it was only through text. So on Tuesday night, Sarah realizes like, oh, we actually haven't spoken to Brandon, heard his voice. So she tried to call him. It was uh, 8 p.m. the first time she called. There was no answer. And then a little bit after 10, she tried again and there was no answer from Brandon. And he also wasn't calling back, which was concerning to her. All of Wednesday, she just anxiously waited for him to call. He never did. On Thursday, she had made the decision that since she hadn't heard from him, she was going to, you know, kind of overstep her mama, adult son boundaries there of just like showing up at the apartment and just follow her gut instinct. 
to see if something actually was wrong. She called him eight times though between 11.53 a.m. and 2.16 p.m. to give him ample notice that she was gonna be showing up. No answer though. At that point, she made the decision to go over to Brandon's apartment with his sister. As she pulled into the parking lot, she sees Brandon's truck is there. So she goes, knocks on the door, expecting to have Brandon answer, but there's no answer. She didn't have an extra key, nor did Brandon's sister, and she specifically remembered that a couple months prior, Brandon had mentioned something to his sister about not knowing where his extra key was and needing to get one cut. So they can't get in the front door. They make their way around the back and they see that there is some damage to the back window. It almost looks like the frame of the window is bent. So seeing this, the fact that his truck is there, not speaking to him for several days, she's just got that gut instinct. Something's wrong and she calls 911. When first responders arrive, Sarah's asked to wait outside. They enter Brandon's apartment and they find Brandon and he is barely clinging on to life. First responders found Brandon. He was on the floor of his bedroom, nude. He was barely breathing. He was unconscious and he was just like riddled with injuries. There was quite a significant amount of blood near his head area, but it also looked like there was like some, there was like some pooling of water that was coming from the bathroom close by from the bathtub, which was odd because Brandon's family said he didn't take baths. He's a really big dude, just wasn't his jam. He's rushed to the hospital, his family follows, but doctors come out and say like, it's, it's really not looking good. They did make the decision to transfer him to another hospital just for a higher level of care. Unfortunately though, Brandon's health declined quite rapidly. Doctors came out once again to let Brandon's family know the prognosis and that there was virtually nothing that they could do anymore and that they had to make the gut-wrenching decision to remove Brandon from life support. And he died at 8.57 p.m. on Friday, September 13th. And this is where in the story things go from absolutely heartbreaking to what in the mother of shit are you talking about? Detectives are brought into Brandon's apartment to try and piece together what happened. As the detectives are going through his apartment, it's just in disarray. From the moment you walk in, like the easiest way to put it is, is a disaster. There were piles of just like things everywhere. In the living room, there were piles of like the moving boxes, but they were also just like covering all of the furniture. Some of them were torn apart. You couldn't sit anywhere. In the kitchen, there was so much stuff on the floor, you couldn't even walk through it. And from the hallway leading to the bedrooms in the back, you could just see like from Brandon's bedroom, just like stuff spilling out from it into the hallway. It wasn't actually until you arrived to Brandon's room to see it was so much worse than just like clutter and mess from just walking in. Inside Brandon's room, the door was removed from the hinges. His nightstand was flipped over. His bedding was missing. His mattress was just covered in large blood stains. His closet door was one of those ones that had like the, the sliding doors. They were ripped off, lying on the floor, stained with blood. On the floor amongst chaos, there was a bunch of electronics, there was garbage, a fairly large amount of blood there as well, and the shower curtain with like the rod. And this is the area of the floor that Brandon was initially found. In the bathroom, absolutely destroyed. The medicine cabinet was shattered. The toilet seat and cover were ripped off. There was like the top of the toilet just smashed in the bathtub. The toilet was actually even lifting off the ground. All of the towel holders, the toilet paper holders were ripped off. It looked like the bowl was backed up just like full of a bunch of stuff. And the bathtub was left running. So during an investigation, when detectives are going through that scene, they're also communicating with hospital staff. And then once the, you know, if, if the patient passes, then with the medical examiner. So 
Brandon passed away on a Friday. His autopsy was on a Monday. And like I mentioned, Brandon was just covered in injuries, many of them to like his face and head area. He had a fairly deep Y-shaped cut on his eyebrow, cuts to the bridge of his nose, his forehead, a lot of scratches. His lips were bruised and even that little part of your mouth, I know, or in your lip, I know there's a specific term for it, you know, where it like attaches though to the gum, that was ripped. His eyes were black and blue. It's known as raccoon eyes. It's not a black eye per se though. It usually happens when there's a quite a significant skull fracture that happened. Moving down his body, he was covered in scratches. There were very significant bruises that almost appeared to the medical examiner to be sustained by like a bat or something. There was a small sledgehammer type mallet found at the scene of Brandon's apartment. His wrists, palms, forearms all had these like deep jagged cuts on them that were described as signs of defensive wounds possibly. And both of his legs down to his toes were injured. His right toe even had like quite a big chunk of skin missing. So when the hospital staff had first seen Brandon, they made the comment that it looked like he was a patient that they would see that would be brought in from a, like a vehicle hitting somebody, like a pedestrian being hit by a car. But based on all of this, police believed that Brandon had this break from reality. He lost his mind, went in a drug fueled rage and just destroyed his apartment, injured himself, and ultimately was found unconscious in a pool of his own blood. For the record, several medical staff had told the police that they did not believe that this was self-inflicted, but this was the early on theory. The only thing that Brandon's family can really make sense of going based on the report, because you're, you're probably like me being like, how? You see the condition of this apartment, this man, he had been seen in the ER, run for numerous drug tests, had no history of drug use. Where is this coming from? But they mentioned in the report that they discovered like hypodermic needles on the floor in his bedroom. And Brandon's family's like, well, that is very explainable. He is treating himself for low testosterone. It sounds like this is just something that they didn't want to get past though. And then coupled with the fact that it didn't appear that there was any forced entry to the house. Also within the disaster of Brandon's home, he still had electronics, his wallet was there. Um, his laptop was there, so it didn't look like anything of value was missing. Aside from some damage to the back screen, both the front and back door were also locked, so they figured, you know, nobody could have gotten in or out. I guess after going through these theories with the medical examiner and the medical staff that had treated Brandon, there was a little bit of shift in tone in the investigation. They had applied for another search warrant and then in the, that search warrant, when you have to give a reasoning why you would like it, they did point out that there were injuries to Brandon's body that they wanted to see if they could make sense, that it looked like he was struck with something like a metal rod or a baseball bat. And they also mentioned these defensive type wounds that the medical examiner had brought up in his report. There's another search, but nothing really seems to change. Everyone, I, I don't know if you wanna call it just either tunnel vision or so confused that they don't even know where to start with anything. In the meantime though, toxicology report came back and there was no evidence of the illegal drugs that kind of kept coming back into the picture here. They did however find, I'm going to just annihilate this word right now, apologies, but if you've been here forever, you know what happens. They did find diphen hydramine, d d we're not even trying to say it fast. It's an active ingredient in Benadryl. They found that in his system. So piecing together all of what they have from this all over the place investigation, the theory of what happened to Brandon changes 
again, and the medical examiner lists Brandon's cause of death as natural causes, citing pneumonia as the contributing factor of his death. This again is really confusing because in his report with the findings it says that the lungs were examined and there were signs that the tissue of his lungs were firm and filled with fluid, which was a sign of pneumonia. However, in a other report, it says the lungs were clear. When it came to the injuries on Brandon's body, they are acknowledged. Apologies, I think that I, I said the medical examiner and then and said he, it, it was a female, Dr. Lauren Scott. To acknowledge the injuries, it was almost just like a, yeah, we, there's a lot of injuries, goes through the injuries. She says she doesn't know what happened to have those injuries form on Brandon's body, but that they weren't contributing factors to his death. They're actually referred to as superficial. And we are going to try to include like a little bit of a censored photo of Brandon for you just to understand like the severity of it and understand why this is so frustrating. I'm just gonna go out on a limb now and say that YouTube has already <laughs> said no to this. So I have the link to Brandon's mother's Facebook page for the fight for Brandon. And in there, there's just tons of reports and photos and at your own discretion, you can go and see them. They are severe though. Like <laughs> for somebody to say, oh, this is just superficial. And yeah, they're there, but like it just, it doesn't contribute to the death. So we're just not even gonna acknowledge them. It's just infuriating. So given all that, the manner of death is classified as natural. Now, something I think that we don't, think about often in these cases is the aftermath for the family and not necessarily in terms of the emotions that they obviously are dealing with. Like we, we I think do a wonderful job over here. All of my supporters are very empathetic and respectful to victims and their families. But something on top of that is kind of what you're left to deal with after in terms of like affairs and cleaning up apartments and packing them so that the landlord can just rent it off to somebody else as if your loved one wasn't there. So it's really hard to think about that, but that's what Brandon's family had to do. They had to go to his family, to his apartment and pack up his things. And one thing that really bothered Brandon's stepdad and mom was that if there was no forced entry, then obviously there should be a key in the house. And even though they found Brandon's truck key ring with his fob on it and what he normally would have his house keys on. There were also several keys found around the apartment. None of the keys were for his front or back door. And they were also really surprised to find how much blood and blood splatter they were finding throughout the apartment. They were definitely under the impression just by speaking to the detectives that everything was very, you know, minor and insignificant. And when they got there, that's not at all what they saw. For example, his comforter and pillow that were just tossed away from the bed, covered in blood. His mattresses, his mattress rather had several areas where it was just soaked in there. Looking around like this was not just, you know, I bumped myself on the head and this in this fuel, whatever my testosterone injection fueled rage because there was no drugs in his system. Even just like on the, on the baseboards, on the floor, on the lower portions of the closet doors that were ripped off of the hinges. Like there was blood everywhere. So they called the detectives and were like, can you come here and let us know if you were in a different apartment? Because like this is not adding up. They also had concerns that there were certain areas that looked like a cleanup had been done. So if this was Brandon acting erratically, he probably wouldn't just like sit there and just like start cleaning a certain area before he just passed out unconscious in a pool of blood on the floor. So the detective comes back, agrees to do some testing, brings the blue star chemical to see if there is any like traces of blood that had been cleaned up. One of the tests in one of the bathrooms came up with no signs of blood. The sledgehammer type weapon tool that was mentioned 
by his family being what could have possibly caused the bruises on his body was also tested, but that also came back negative. And then the bathroom that was connected to where Brandon was kind of found with the whole thing being trashed was also tested in some areas where it looked like there was some cleanup. And then in that bathroom, there was signs that it did appear that there was some sort of cleanup done. So after this, after it's Brandon's family, who is like, please come here and look at what we're looking at, what you were already supposed to have seen, they open up a form of an investigation. And then they decide to look into the final few months of Brandon's life. They pull up his bank statements, his phone records, all of that stuff. So on Sunday, September 8th, which would have been the day after his birthday, just before 10.30 p.m., there was a purchase for a Domino's pizza. The next transaction on his card was on Tuesday. This was at 11, around 11.30 a.m. And this was actually an in-store purchase at a adult store called Adam and Eve. As far as I know, the purchase has never been disclosed. The only thing that I have read about it, I believe that this information even came from Brandon's mom, is that it was a toy that like a female would purchase. The detectives did go and speak to the staff at Adam and Eve. They showed them a picture of Brandon and they said, yes, they had seen him in the store prior, but they couldn't definitively say that they saw him there that Tuesday. Also, my understanding is that the purchase was never found at the scene or photographed. There was another purchase that day that was um, at one of those fast food restaurants called Jade Express. I think this was located in the mall in Ashboro. And something about this purchase that stood out to Brandon's family is the total. It was close to $20. So it seemed like it was for two people because most of the meals there are like around like that eight nine ten dollar mark based off his phone records it looked like the final call that was placed from brandon's phone was on tuesday evening just before 8 30 and it was to a woman that he was seeing talking to in virginia there's really no way to tell what's going on in you know a detective's mind or how they're processing all of this information and how they want to move forward I do know that oftentimes they will still communicate with all of the other parties that are involved in the investigation. So like the medical staff or more importantly, like the medical examiner, if there's like a district attorney involved, them as well. And it just appears to me that there must have been some communication going on with the detectives and the medical examiner because on February 7th, 2020, Brandon's manner of death was changed. It was changed to undetermined from natural. It doesn't seem though like this was done to open up the door to investigate something that was foul play. One of the theories that the detective that took over, Detective Lori Johnson, was that she still believed that this was drug induced that Brandon overdosed, but by the time the toxicology was administered, his body had metabolized the drugs. Therefore, they didn't show up. And you can see that this is where that communication was going between Detective Johnson and Dr. Scott. Dr. Scott's report says, upon further discussion of the case, it is suggested that Brandon's organ damage may have been caused by a substance ingestion on September 10th that had metabolized by the 12th. She also said that substance ingestion may have been the cause of death and this cannot be proven or disproven by the autopsy findings. 
so even though we weren't a fly on the wall, we kind of are in terms of them saying like, upon further discussion, discussing this together, this is what Detective Johnson believes and therefore what she has convinced me to put on this paper. And with this update to his autopsy on February 27th, 2020, five months after the investigation, Brandon's case was closed. Obviously not shocking. This is a punch in the gut to Brandon's family. I mean, it's a punch in the gut reading this and researching this and listening to podcasts and listening to his mom speak and watching all of her TikToks. That's, this is what this has turned into because from that moment on, Brandon's mom, Sarah, has turned into a full-blown investigator in her son's death, just pleading for answers and wondering why she sees something that seems to be so obvious and clear, yet the detectives and medical examiner in this are just dragging their heels and turning a blind eye. At the center of Sarah's investigation into what happened to Brandon is a woman, a woman that Brandon allegedly was seeing named Cassandra. Cassandra actually came into Sarah's life. Sarah did not go and seek her out. It was five days after Brandon had passed and Cassandra had reached out to Brandon's sister-in-law, so his brother Scott's wife. She reached out to her on Facebook Messenger and said, so her, her message was, hey, I know you don't know me at all, but you're Brandon Wesley Embry's sister and I was your brother's girlfriend from mid-May until his passing. I met him on a dating app called Hinge. He sent me a text with a crying emoji on Tuesday the 10th and I haven't heard from him since and I've been a worried mess since then. He never told me your mom's name, but he did say that he had a sister that was in Kentucky. I found out the hard way yesterday when I went by his apartment at Park Place in Ashboro on South Church Street yesterday evening and some woman told me he died. I hope you know how wonderful of a man he was and I thought the world of him. Also in this message, she also asks if she could have a sweatshirt of Brandon's to remember him by and then she asks if she can pick up some of the things that she had left at his apartment, like toiletries, makeup, and some clothes. So Brandon's sister-in-law forwarded this directly on to Sarah, and she immediately reached out to Cassandra, and they communicated almost daily for the next 10 months. Through this communication with her, it kind of went from wanting to just like hold on to those last few months of Brandon and see like a different side of him coming from somebody who he cared about and who cared from him to very strange, odd, ominous things that were coming from Cassandra. One thing that is not very clear is like the timeline of the relationship. She's quite conflicting with it as well. We know that they did meet on a dating app called Hinge. She had mentioned to his sister-in-law that they had been dating since May, but Brandon had mentioned somebody that sounded like her to his sister in February. He said though that he didn't think that the relationship was going to go anywhere because she was going to be moving back to Russia where her and her family were from. So Sarah's personal opinion of Cassandra, and that doesn't, you know, mean anything dark. It's just that it was very intense and she came on very strong. Cassandra painted the picture that she and Brandon were soulmates. They were madly in love. They were planning on getting married. They had rings picked out. She even showed Brandon's mom a photo of a ring that she said Brandon picked out for her and she couldn't wait to wear. They were going to have babies. In fact, she actually had been pregnant but lost the baby and her and Brandon were so devastated that they wanted to have another one. She even sent her photos of an ultrasound. And all of this just kind of knocking her off her feet because Brandon hadn't mentioned any of this. So things started getting really questionable when she would mention things like how close that they were and and then kind of being entitled to some of Brandon's things. She said that they were in the process of opening up a joint bank account together and since they were going to do that but they didn't, she felt like she was entitled to whatever was in his account. 
things just weren't really making sense, especially because if something was this serious, Brandon was quite close with his family. Even though he you know, was introverted, kept to himself, he still communicated with his family when he did see them. He was never like a secretive guy. He texted a lot even you know, with his sister and nothing like in terms of getting ready to get married and have kids and settle down and open up a bank account together was anywhere on anybody's radar. Nobody in the family knew this woman by name. But Sarah wanted to keep in touch and see if, you know, maybe there was something that Cassandra knew that she didn't even realize might, you know, lead to helping Sarah figure out what happened to Brandon. So the two of them would communicate usually by Facebook Messenger. Sometimes they would text, sometimes they would call, and they actually even met up in person four times. And while Sarah was communicating with Cassandra, she's also staying in touch with the detectives also sharing like her concerns that these are the things that are being told to me. I, this, and this is just, it, there's just like something that my gut is saying like there's something off here. Have you talked to this woman? So the detectives do some digging and they also find it very hard to believe that Brandon and Cassandra are as close as she's portraying because when they looked through phone records, they saw that there was some interaction between them, but there was far more interaction between him and another woman that he had mentioned to others like being more interested in. And this is really interesting because while Sarah is communicating with the detectives, you know, feeding them some information and the detectives are calling to just follow up and clarify some of the stuff with Cassandra herself. Cassandra is calling Brandon's mom, Sarah, and venting to her and having her concerns like, why, why do they want to talk to me? Oh, I'm stressed out. Oh my gosh. Like, and she's all worried. And you'd figure, well, if there's nothing to be stressed out about and something sinister has happened to the love of your life here you know we got to work with these people to help solve it like get get on the same page as me in solving this crime because something's wrong here and i just want to sit down and have a conversation with you face to face and i was like well i'm not in trouble i've done nothing to him uh -huh. anybody else for that matter yeah you know i'm not out here hurting anybody he's like i didn't think that you did hurt him i just want to know what you feel as that person and I was like well I told you like over the telephone what else do you want me to tell you yeah and I come up very like I don't know how to say it like my grandmother used to say I was like very cold when it comes to things so I come up very cold and sterile with people unless I like you I don't know what I feel like and he's not here to be like hey this is the person like this is what's going on in my life yeah you know what I mean so it's just kind of like my end of this when it should be mine and Brandon's end of this. Mm -hmm. Talk about Brandon and what you know about Brandon and that will help them just figure out what happened to Brandon. You know, like information that you have, they can kind of put it together, whether it's helping the coroner, you know, make a determination what to look for, it helps them put information together. Yeah, that's good. That makes I'm trying really hard not to cry with you right now. Alone, trying to piece it together with a fucking detective that I have no idea about, that I don't trust, that I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, it all goes back to all of it. Mm -hmm. my, whole, my whole life with him. Yeah. It wasn't long enough. No, it wasn't. And I had my whole life. Had to go away, and now I was picking up the pieces to what happened to him. Detectives had planned to meet up with Cassandra, have her come into the station in November. She actually called Sarah and said that I'm just going to tell them I'm not feeling well. I don't, I don't want to go in. Which why are you telling his mother this? Anyways, Sarah even tells the detectives she's going to cancel on you, and she does. But they, they are able to convince her to come in, answer some questions in December. So when she goes in and speaks with detectives, things are much more downplayed than they seem to be when she's talking to, to Brandon's mom. Now she's like, oh, she had gone out to see him maybe like three or four times only in Asheboro. She says that the last time she was in town was 
Brandon's birthday. That would have been five days before he was found. And then the next time she was at his apartment was about a week after his death. And she said that she had just gone there to check on him and she ran into a neighbor and it was the neighbor who said that Brandon had passed. During this interview, they also asked to do a a phone dump of her phone, basically where they just want to pull all of his contents and see what she's got cooking. She consented, but this is interesting because as she agreed, the detectives leave the room to go and set up like the meeting, how this is all gonna go down. I, I automatically just kind of referenced the Chandler Halderson case. If you watch that video where we got to see uh, the interview process of his girlfriend speaking to detectives and they wanted to do a phone dump on hers and she's so precious, she even like makes them pinky swear not to like keep her nudes on there poor little thing but like in order to coordinate that it's like okay do you give us consent all right well we got to go get like the paperwork there's you can't just like take it and go and so they leave the room go get the paperwork and they have to actually drive to the sheriff's station where they are like equipped to be able to pull the information so when the detective leaves he sees on the camera that she's just like furiously like typing or like messing around with her phone. He arranges everything, comes back and they ride together to the sheriff's office to do the phone dump. She rides with the detective and he also sees in the rear view mirror, she's just like frantically typing away on her phone. So when they hook it up to like the forensic device, nothing was recovered. There wasn't even like GPS coordinates on it, no text messages, phone calls, photos, anything. And it didn't make sense because she had shown her last text message between Brandon to the detective just like minutes before they left in the room. So the technician doing this you know, retrieval was like the only thing that I can think of that would do something like this to the phone is a, a quick factory reset. My understanding is the detectives did reach out to her provider, which was Verizon, to get a search warrant to produce like full phone records and like all of the critical like data on the phone that they could. They did receive something back, but have not released those records. Again, immediately after leaving, she calls Sarah and she's like laughing like, oh, that's that was it? Like that's all they wanted? I'm just trying to understand like the, the intentions, the thought process. Like th these actions don't necessarily mean like someone is guilty, but if I were to just be like, oh yeah, I went in for an interview. I was expecting way worse. I would probably like save that conversation for my best friend, not just like the mother of my boyfriend or whatever future husband in my eyes. And like, I, it just like, it, I don't know, it just seems so insulting and in poor taste to do that to his mother. Sarah kept communicating with her though. And during like each communication, she's just like finding more and more red flags about her. She does find out that this, must have been the girl that Brandon was referring to when he was talking to his sister about the relationship not lasting because she was gonna move to Russia because Cassandra herself had told basically the same story to Sarah, which isn't like anything super suspicious, except for Sarah finds out that she or her family, like nobody is from Russia and she wasn't gonna be moving to Russia. She's actually from Maine, so were her parents and her grandparents. She also said things like she had a twin sister who died in a car crash. She does have a sister, it's not a twin, and she is alive and well. In other phone calls with Sarah, she mentioned she also had a brother. There is no brother. She mentioned that when she was 14 years old, she had a baby, but that the baby had passed away after it got tangled up in blankets. This also is not true. She's also claimed to have like several serious health issues like multiple sclerosis, diagnosed obsessive compulsive disorder. Again, not true. And she says that she also has a master's in nursing, a black belt in, a fifth degree black belt actually, um, in ju jujitsu, third degree in Muay Thai boxing. She doesn't. And one of the ways this all came to light and Sarah knows that these things are not true is because somebody 
very close to Cassandra agreed to talk to Sarah, and that is Cassandra's husband, a gentleman named Danny, who was living in South Carolina the whole time she was talking to Brandon. They had been married since 2012, and Danny said that like for a little bit the marriage was good. There were a little bit of red flags when he had proposed to her. She had accepted, but then didn't tell her family. And then when they went to go meet the family, she had convinced him to like stage this proposal so that it was done in front of them. Again, like things that aren't like major, but like he was like, okay, why are we doing this? And then she, he said by like 2019, the whole relationship had shifted. It was like they were just kind of coexisting and not really in a marriage at all. They were sleeping in, in separate bedrooms and she would just go MIA. Sometimes she would go missing for like a day. Sometimes she'd be gone for like a couple months. He also found like a number of burner phones and there was always an excuse like that it was for this job or this job that she had. And you, like, the jobs that she had were like at IHOP and stuff, like so not really places where you'd think like you needed like an extra, an extra phone. He said he just kind of saw her as like a, a, quite an embellisher. Like he, he tolerated it for whatever reason because there was a part of him that like cared for her, but nothing that really came out of her mouth was believable. She had also told him that she had children prior to being with him. This, this time she said she had twins and that they had passed. Once again, there's no record of her ever having twins. And on top of Danny, there was also a ex-boyfriend that Sarah reached out to who Cassandra dated prior to getting married to Danny. In the blog that I read, they referred to him as Kevin, so I'm gonna do the same. So Kevin and Cassandra had a three-year relationship and he also was very cooperative and wanted to help Sarah get as many answers as she could about Cassandra. And I feel that that really speaks volumes when you know, two men who don't know each other but shared like the same romantic partner at you know what point in their lives want to speak out about their experience. And when you hear their stories, you get a better sense of why they felt compelled to do so. So even though they didn't know each other, they really had like disturbing similarities when it came to their time with Cassandra. As Danny was learning about some of the circumstances surrounding Brandon's death, things that were concerning him in his life, specifically his health, started to make sense. Danny said that in 2019, like he was in really poor health. Around the time where Brandon had like his first visit to the ER and Danny had shown Sarah a photo of him that was taken on a hike that he was on. And in the photo, he's like, look at how sickly I look. Like he was uh, described as jaundice in this photo. And he said he remembered that hike specifically just being like, I do not think that I'm going to be able to get through this and make it a lot. He just kind of chalked it up to something was going on with him, just maybe like as he was getting older, things were changing, but he just never experienced like ex exhaustion and just being so worn down like that in his life. Just going to work simply just took everything out of him where he wouldn't even eat dinner. He would just walk in the door and go to bed. Looking back though, he said, you know, every time Sarah would kind of go rogue for a while, I felt good. And he started to piece together things that he had really just shoved aside, like that nothing sinister was happening. And he had shared with Sarah that he had a very strict, not strict, but just like regular routine every morning. He would wake up, he would go and start to brew his coffee. And as it was brewing, he would go to the bathroom, have his shower, and then come out and enjoy his coffee before he went to work. And he said that Cassandra was like a very heavy footed person. You could hear her in any area of the house. And he sometimes would hear her getting out of bed, walking around the house while he was in the bathroom. But when he would come out of the bathroom after a shower, she wasn't walking around the house. And when he would go and check on her to be like, hey, do you want breakfast or coffee or anything? She would be like uh, pretending to be asleep in her room. He just figured, okay, like maybe she's just like avoiding me. I'm not gonna press this. But then speaking to Sarah, he felt like he was being poisoned. Something was being put in his coffee. His routine every day was to take a thermos to work with his coffee. And whenever he did that and heard her, 
he'd feel nauseous and weak and just completely run down all day. There was one incident he actually passed out driving home, ended up on the other side of the ditch. Thankfully, no one was hurt. He wasn't either, but it scared him and he didn't know what was going on, similar to Brandon. When Sarah spoke to Kevin, she asked him if maybe there was anything, you know, health rate related that he was going through at the same time as well with his time with Cassandra. And he said there was a couple incidents where looking back, like it was just like a screaming red flag. He said one time Cassandra had passed him a cigarette and immediately he sees this cigarette and it looks like it's got this like substance like rubbed into it. And it just made him feel like uncomfortable, like enough so that he was like, I I don't want those smokes, stopped at the gas station and got another pack and only smoked the ones from the pack that he bought. And he noticed that Cassandra asked to have one of his smokes from the new pack and threw out that other pack, would not smoke this full pack that she was trying to get him to smoke. And then there was an incident that to this day still affects his life. And he drank a vitamin water that Cassandra had given to him that she had already opened. He said later that day, he was so sick, he couldn't remember a time that he had been like that violently throwing up. To this day, he remembers it like so strongly that he will never take something from somebody that is already open. So piecing together the timeline of Brandon's health issues, it started around that same time that Brandon and Cassandra had met on Hinge. His symptoms were similar to Danny and Kevin's, but like far more severe. He ended up in the ICU almost dead. Dialysis is pretty much what saved him. And this happened like three to four times, which is interesting because that's about the amount of times that she told the, the detectives that she had gone to visit him. On top of the health issues, Kevin also like shared the same feeling in terms of her lying habits. Like everything was just a lie. He felt, he said that she told people her uncle was in the mafia and she had family in the police force, that she was actually married to a cop at one point. She also told Kevin that she was pregnant. His mother threw a very elaborate baby shower for her. But as the months were going by, there were a little bit of, of concerns because she didn't appear to be pregnant. And that can happen. I, I personally know of people who have been pregnant and have never really looked like they were pregnant. And I think that's that that's what she was also going off of. But when the due date came, she said that she went to go and deliver the baby, but the doctor couldn't figure out how to get the baby out. So like the baby just passed inside her and like that's where the baby stayed. <laughs> So if you know anything about pregnancy and how it works, it doesn't work like that. Something that really bothered Sarah was that both of these men also said that Cassandra would often take their phone and pretend to be them, text other people. And it's that stood out to Sarah because she felt like the last few times that she had spoken to Brandon, just like it just did not sound like him, which was part of her concern of wanting to call him and hear his voice. And then an, a really big red flag that Kevin shared was that Cassandra was very interested in accessing like his finances. She would go to the bank and pretend that she was his wife and forge his signature and cash his checks. He said at one time she even cashed $2,500 worth of money and then just went MIA. Again, being a compulsive liar doesn't mean you're a murderer poisons people. But something that started to not really sit right with Sarah was that Cassandra started sharing things about the crime scene and, uh, you know, about the condition of Brandon's apartment that she said that she would learn in dreams or through like psychics. So about two weeks later, I'm talking to her on the phone and she's describing her dreams and these dreams talk about specific places where I had seen blood or new things that had happened. So I decide to record her and I ask her if she will describe those dreams to me again. You're looking at the bed and he's over by the closet. He's literally just standing in the closet, massive white, but he's big enough that the wall, like where the closet is, he's bigger than that face, essentially. 
And then, she's talking about the closet where there was a lot of blood and blood spray and blood on the corner. And she says in her dream that he's standing by this closet and he looks white as a ghost. He's there, but he's white as a ghost. Like, white as a ghost. Like, I don't, I would never understand why he was so white in my dream, but he was whiter than white. She described him being on the ground, naked, on the floor, in his room, and nothing about how Brennan had been found had been released. So you would, I, I guess, assume that you'd only know that if you were there. There was a conversation, or a few conversations actually, where she almost kind of like bragged that she knew where Brandon kept his spare key, but when she went to go check on him, it wasn't there. So it's kind of almost like, why was that information given up? Was it almost given up so that you could just abolish any questioning? I don't know. So the main question here is like, if something sinister is happening to these men, why? You know, what's the motive? And how, if there's poisoning going on, was that happening? And from talking with Danny, Sarah and him believe that it has something to do with Cassandra's obsession with a certain brand of sleeping pills, particularly the e Equate, Equate brand from Walmart. Danny said that Cassandra would ask him for these sleeping pills on a, like a weekly basis, like several times a week. He would be going to repurchase these, like I, I believe there's gotta be like 50 or so capsules in there and like multiple times a week going to get these or I would buy at least two 100 pill bottles of sleeping pills, Walmart Equate brand, because they were like 10 bucks a pop, and uh -huh. that was $20. And I would buy those a lot, maybe $100 worth a month, so wow. she could sleep. But to hear her voice on that, talking to you and seeing that Facebook page. So in the photos of Brandon's apartment, th there are bottles that you can see of the same brand. And two reasons that stuck out to his mom was that she had never, one, known of Brandon to ever talk about having like sleeping issues, especially enough to need like sleeping pills. Like he was on a CPAP machine. If I'm not mistaken, I don't think you're supposed to even like do that if you're on a CPAP machine. Second, he, was kind of like a brand snob, you know? Nothing wrong with that, but if there was like a, a higher end brand of a sleeping pill, like that's what he would go for, not like the Walmart brand. Also in the crime scene photos, there's like Benadryl capsules that like it looks like the gel has been pushed out of. And remember in his toxicology report, there was no sign of illegal drugs, but it did come back positive for the, we're not even gonna try to say it again, <laughs> active ingredient in Benadryl. Sarah kind of tried to nonchalantly ask if Cassandra had any information about like his sleeping pill Benadryl habits. And she did mention that she knew that they took the same brand of sleeping pills. And even on the phone starts to like wonder, maybe he did something silly. Maybe he took his own life by these sleeping pills. I recorded our conversation and I'm going to play some of it can kind of judge for yourself. The only thing I could tell him is like sleeping pills and energy pills, you know what I mean? That's what I base it down on to. Yeah. Oh, God, I'm so stressed out now. So stressful to me. Yeah. He had a lot of sleeping pills. I know that much. Mm-hmm. But when he took too many of them, I don't think so. You know, I, I can't see him doing that either. No don't see him doing anything to like jeopardize his life yeah i don't either <laughs> yeah the whole thing is just like so confusing and listening to sarah talk about this you, you can't help but wonder like why why if there if there is any connection here would she have reached out to brandon's family at all and i guess like you can think of like all right it maybe it's to mourn Brandon together, reflect on his life if there isn't anything sinister. But if these allegations are true, maybe it's to have information, keep tabs on the investigation, provide information that you may think will sway it into another direction. I mean, there's so many ways this can go. In terms of an investigation though, there 
isn't one right now. Sarah is the only person investigating her son's death. She is all over social media, on TikTok, on Facebook. She has been a guest on a lot of podcasts. There's so much out there and it, these cases are so frustrating because it seems so clear and I don't know how many ways I can ask the same question of like, at what point does like some other party involve themselves when a family has done this much work, has this much questionable evidence that needs to be given a proper answer and not just like, oh yeah, like we'll acknowledge that it's weird, but we'll move on because we think this was a drug overdose. Like there needs to be somewhere that someone steps in to assist. One of the reasons why she feels at this point there hasn't been a reinvestigation or continued investigation is some really poor decisions were made by the Ashboro police force. And that's when she was looking into hiring her own private investigator, doing her own investigation, going through the evidence that they had of Brandon's and paying for it on her own. She realized that everything was signed off to be destroyed. So there is no evidence whatsoever. And very early on in the investigation in Brandon's death, when Sarah was feeling like everybody was on the same page and investigators were looking into things prior to it being like ruled natural cause, the detective had assured her that they were doing everything that they could. They were gonna figure out what happened because she had concerns that, I believe it was Brandon's request that he wanted to be cremated and she wasn't sure if that was the right call, if they were going to need to do further testing and she was told like they had everything that they needed. So now at this point, there's not even like his fingernail clippings left to try to pull DNA if somebody attacked him and he was trying to defend himself and they don't even have Brandon's remains and his organs to retest because he was cremated and everything has just been destroyed. They also missed some massive opportunities to confirm whether or not it was Brandon making those final purchases. The adult store had surveillance by the time it was requested to get a copy of it. It had already been destroyed. Same with the fast food restaurant at the mall. It was way too late to get it and I mean, that just kind of puts it in perspective because out of a mall and all of the other stores surrounding it, how long was a request waited to like be made or was there even a request? Sarah strongly believes that Brandon was being poisoned for a long time. When you look at the signs of poisoning and you look at the symptoms that he was showing each time he had gone to the ER, they're basically verbatim the same. It doesn't really answer why Brandon's apartment was in the condition it was. If this was Cassandra in his life that had done that, did she act solo? Sarah believes that somebody else may be involved. There were actually two witnesses in his apartment complex that saw Brandon arguing with a gentleman right prior to his death and they notified Sarah about this. They even told the detectives and they were never questioned. There was no follow up. It was just like, oh, okay, thanks. As they were passing, no one called, got their information, anything. Detective Lori Johnson wrote in her report while speaking with Miss Lee, she had advised Mr. Embry was talking to someone in the parking lot, maybe the maintenance, the guy. What I told detectives was that Brandon's neighbor beside him had said that he saw Brandon run out and talk to the maintenance guy. However, a different neighbor said they saw a man in front of Brandon's apartment and this man and Brandon were having an argument. And I told Detective Suddeth that it was very odd to me because Brandon wasn't the type of person to have arguments with people. Actually, I was not the only one that talked to this neighbor who was a witness of Brandon and this man having an argument because the day that we called the detectives, Detective Suddeth and Detective Johnson, back over to Brandon's apartment to discuss the blood that was everywhere, they left Brandon's apartment and they walked over to this witness and wanted to know if she had enough car seats in her van. When they approached her, 
she said yes she had enough car seats but she also brought up that she had saw this person arguing with Brandon and the police never checked into it they didn't get a statement from her they didn't ask her to come in they did not investigate anything further I'll leave it with this. It's my personal, unprofessional opinion that something very questionable is happening here. What I feel like given all of this evidence and theories and statements, natural or an overdose. And I believe that there, if there aren't already other victims, there is possibility for more. Something that this woman likes to brag about is the amount of friends that she has lost in a phone conversation with Sarah, she actually mentioned that in the two year span, like quite recent, like the two year span recently when they were communicating, she had lost 14 friends or 13 and one of them was really sick who would potentially be 14. From the time I met this female, she said that she had a friend who was dying and she would stay with this dying friend when she came to town. She said the husband would be away and she would stay and help take care of her. And there were so many things that pointed toward psychopathic behavior that I started writing things down and I contacted the male detective, Detective Suddeth at Asheboro Police Department. And it was kind of awkward I had written down about eight pages of things that she had said. And I just thought, well, it's better to say something than not say something. So I went in and spoke to the detective and told him my concerns about this female. And I think my main concern was that she said she had 13 friends that died in two and a half years, including my murdered son. And her friend Dee Dee would be the 14th. Brandon's mom has found two obituaries that she believes are connected. One gal had worked at the same IHOP as Cassandra and died suddenly due to stomach issues. The other woman died close, like in close proximity to Brandon. Apparently this was by like her unaliving herself. Now, as far as I know, there's just, I don't know if there's like a direct proof of a connection. She did make reference to one of the girls who like had unalived herself. This girl, she was referring to this girl by her nickname, telling her husband that she was gonna go and visit her and take care of her because she wasn't doing well. Referred to her husband as well, saying that he was out of town so she was helping and those names all matched. I'm not gonna say them just because I don't know, but if you, like I said, if you wa wanna go to the Facebook page and look at all of the work that Sarah has done, it's on there. And I guess the really concerning part is, is that Kevin, the ex-boyfriend Kevin, his wife brought up something very interesting that th the common thread here with the people that she chooses to like date or have in her life are all like like introverted and his wife used the term loners so they're not somebody who's like constantly in contact with people or like going out so they will keep to themselves a little bit more but like invite that companionship over to have people like come and like do the whole like order a pizza watch some movies which is concerning because there could be people out there who are in danger and their family just like wouldn't know for a really long time because it's just normal for them to just do their own thing super Super frustrating. I reached out to Sarah. I asked if there was any way that we can support. Right now she is just like plowing through with her own investigation. She's hoping to connect with like blood splatter specialists, all of the specialists. There's just like so much evidence that she needs help pouring through and just like putting like a really clear timeline and investigation together. I'm going to see what I can do in terms of like resources that I've already made myself. If anybody watching this has any of those types of connections, please, please reach out. You can actually email the Sippendale Foundation email. It's contact at sippendalefoundation.com with any assistance that you might have. She also has a GoFundMe set up for the fees. I've mentioned this so many times, you guys, like the fees for a fight like this is just like, it's so astronomical, so frustrating because this is not the job of victims families but here we are with another case where apparently it is the only positive thing i'm just trying to hold on to right now for sarah is that the emmy's current ruling is that it's undetermined so that does leave room for change usually when it's just like set in concrete and done 
it's so much harder to reverse that. So that is very huge. So any help that we can give to Sarah, um, I'd love to be able to do that. Like I said, I'm going to leave the GoFundMe, the Facebook, if you want to reach out and speak to her on there and give her some support. She's working so hard. I can't imagine what this feels like to be doing this yourself. So yeah, thank you guys so much for everything you do. I already know you're just going to go above and beyond and send her all the love like you always do. So thank you. All right, that is it for me today. If you haven't already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It means the world to me. I love and I appreciate you so freaking much. The answer to today's riddle, I almost forgot. Quick reminder, what has hands but cannot clap? And the answer is a clock. All right, <laughs> that is it. I will see you in the next video. I will miss you terribly. Until then, make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon. Bye.